Welcome to From the Median, a daily report from the front line of the pro-life movement, discussing two worldviews that are driving our culture in opposite directions. From the Median asks, which side of the road are you on? What direction do you want our culture to go? Tune in as we plan the route that takes us back to the culture of life. And now your host, Molly Smith. Good evening and welcome to From the Median, where we are concerned with the middle ground, not just to understand both sides of an argument, but also to awaken the consciences of those who are neutral or indifferent to this, the greatest civil rights movement of our times, the pro-life movement. Listeners, today we have a returning guest with us. I'm thrilled to have him back on the program. He hasn't been with us for a while, so it's great to welcome Michael Voris back to the program. Welcome to the program, Michael Voris. Thank you very much, Molly. And God you, bless you. Thank you, Mike. And you know what? I think I say your name differently from what everybody else says because I hear your name pronounced in a very different way. So you tell people, what is your last name? How do you pronounce it? Michael Voris. Oh, you like, like me? Boris. Yes. Yeah. Oh, just like I say, because exactly. I hear everybody saying it. I'm going, oh, maybe I've got this wrong, but I don't. No, I, everybody, I'm, wants, everybody wants to say Voorhees and Voorhees. And, and, uh, it's it's and, that, and there is a branch of the family that's that, but ours is just Voris. Michael Voris. Michael Voris is the executive editor, What all kinds of accolades behind his name, all kinds of authority, all kinds of things. But he basically is the man that has put together St. Michael's Media and also the Vortex, which comes comes out every single day. It is just the most incredibly wonderful program. Many of you out there are, I know, are followers of Michael Voris's Vortex. I also know that many of you, are perhaps even those that are not Catholic, this is you know, unabashedly a Catholic program, the Vortex is. But I know we have many, many non-Catholics that also listen to or watch your program, Michael, which is a, a sort of seven to ten minute brief overview of what's going on in the world and why we need to be concerned about it, but also very hopeful program, very hopeful, Michael, because you 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 leave the listeners with something to do, but also you give them some meat in what it is, why we believe what we believe in Jesus Christ and, and you know, in, and in our biblical principles. But then also, you know, while, while awakening everybody to what's going on, you have an ability to say, and now here's how you fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that about the vortex. I really do because I think many times that's exactly what you do. But I have you on specifically today because I you have put out very recently you've started something called the resistance. Yes. Michael, tell us how did you come up with this idea and what is this vortex resistance? Well, the resistance is really born from uh a number of people, good number of people who write into us or email us or call us uh, and uh, and are just sort of fed up with conditions in the church. Now, I'd like to make a little parallel case here for people who either may not be Catholic or are Catholic and don't really understand all the things that are going wrong in the church these days. And I'd like to draw a comparison to the culture. You know, there is a very weird thing going on right now that Donald Trump <laughs> is the Republican nominee, or will be shortly, and Bernie Sanders, if you take out the superdelegates, is neck and neck with Hillary over on the Democratic side. And what do both of those men represent? They represent sort of the embodiment of the we're mad as hell with the establishment and we're not going to take it anymore mindset. Mm -hmm. And uh, you even saw that when it got down at the end to – on the Republican side with Trump and Cruz. I mean, Cruz was that same thing. He probably wasn't as, wasn't as much as Trump, but he certainly styled himself as I'm not the establishment. Certainly Trump is not the establishment. And you have this, that dynamic going on. And those two beat out all the establishment guys. Cause I think people have reached this point across the board in like all sorts of institutions, their daily life, their, you know, this idiocy about, you know, you know, right now I identify as a woman, so I'm going to go into the woman's bathroom for five minutes while I'm really a man. All this nuttiness, people are just fed up with it. Mm-hmm. And inside the church, there is Catholic Church in particular, but I know much of this extends to, uh, you know, various Protestant denominations as well, that there is this sort of backing away from tradition backing away from the uh, you know, correct, authentic understanding of who is Jesus Christ, what is the goal of this life, uh, all of these kinds of theological mainstays that have been with us for 
centuries, and they've all been thrown overboard in, uh, uh, you know, certainly in practice or at least sort of common speak, if not actually dogmatically, uh, at least in the Catholic Church. You know, they've all been thrown around, and, and, and you see this in the Barna Group does a number of great pulse, uh, polling institute that uh, usually polls various Protestant denominations, keeps coming up, keeps surfacing this, this we're mad as hell, what's going on mindset. And that same thing is going on in the Catholic world as well. And uh, and so the resistance is sort of a rallying point for people who feel that way when they they hear, you know, crazy things from, you know, U.S. bishops and worldwide bishops about giving Holy Communion to people who are divorced and remarried, which has never been allowed, no. <laughs> ever. It's never even been considered in the Catholic world. I know that in some Protestant worlds that's, you know, not a, a big issue, but it's a huge issue in the Catholic world. And uh, it just seems that there's this constant pandering to the culture and wanting to say, well, you know, we have to try to give people the truth. We have to give it to them in a way in which they can understand it and not really tell them the whole truth. And people are just fed up with that. There's mm-hmm. a huge crowd of people within the church who are fed up with that approach. Mm-hmm. So the resistance is a way to kind of collect these people into as many as we can into one area. And then within diocese by diocese, uh, um, you know, do a number of different uh, initiatives and a number of different efforts uh, in order to sort of reclaim authentic Catholicism that they feel and we feel is really sort of whittling away. Mm-hmm. It's really frittering away because leaders aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And again, I'll run back and wrap it up on this point with that same, uh, you know, thing in the in the political world and in, in the sort of societal world that Americans feel that their leaders have frittered away America Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that they have just let it go. And it's not what it was, you know, 25 years ago, like somewhere there has been this fundamental shift and we may still have, you know, the red, white, and blue flying up the top of flagpoles, but what's underneath those flagpoles ain't America anymore. Exactly. Loads of people who feel that. And I think you have that sense, certainly on the Republican side of the house uh, in the political world, and there's the battle, of course, still going on for that on the Democratic side as well. Mm-hmm. And again, that sense of, you know, they may have the cross on top of the church, but what's going on underneath the church roof, that's not Catholic anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think a lot of people feel. And that's what the resistance is to sort of give a voice to that and help explain it more. With, within this resistance, you know, one of the things that struck me this morning when, you know, when I was thinking about the interview with, with you today um, was there there was a very new piece of news about um what is happening within the 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 justice system the u s justice system um in that there are people you know there the 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 lawyers the prosecutors are lying literally outright lying and oh, yeah, one yeah. of the federal gu- judges has caught them um multiple times pre- presenting false evidence actually lying outright to things and this was specifically to do with the immigration issue but you know when i look at this michael i look at the this is a symptom of the complete collapse of the of of the Christian ideal, of Christ's ideal for the world. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You couldn't be more. You couldn't be more spot on, Molly. That's yeah. exactly correct. Yeah, and and you know, but then how do you do this? Because you know, one of the things, and it sounds, it's a similar type of idea that that we've had with bringing America back to life convention, is that we mm-hmm. what we're trying to do is to empower each region to take on their own. They know what is important in their region. You know, if you go to the east coast and the west coast, you have a very different cultural norm that you're dealing with, as opposed to the Midwest or perhaps the South or the North. Um, but everybody is also is is being impacted by this breakdown of of Christian values and and I look at this Michael and I say you know that the, how do we get this back again? You're talking about a resistance. What exactly are you going to be doing within this resistance? Well, on a number of levels, I mean, the first thing, you know, why has the Christian norm broken down? The Christian norm is broken down because Christians haven't been Christians. Mm-hmm. Very good um, point. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. You know, this is, there, it is, it's not like there's some, you know, green mist going up and down the streets, you know, invading churches. I mean, what's invading churches uh, is Relativism. really, at the end of the day, mm-hmm. a rejection. When people may not say it this way, 
but they behave like it. There is a rejection of Christ in his divinity. That's right. There is a comfortable cultural, you know, friendliness, warmth and friendly and get along with Jesus as my pal, and Jesus is the guy who gives me an emotional high, and he's kind of nice. But people have conformed Christ to them, to themselves. That's right. As opposed to conforming themselves to Christ. And so they wouldn't deny you walk up to somebody who's like in a church and asking them, do you believe Jesus is God? They'll say yes, but then they act totally contrary to it. You know, what? they don't love him. They love a notion of him. They love certain aspects of him that they have projected their feelings and their mindset onto. So in that way, they love their version their of version Jesus. of Jesus Christ exactly we're going to come back we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to really get into the nitty gritty of of some of why you know why it's important that we do form this resistance we're talking to Michael Voris who is with a church militant which puts out the everyday vortex and I'm really encouraging everybody to sign up for that he is also the president and founder of St. Michael's Media so please make sure that you do that we'll be back with him right after this very short break stay with us Welcome back, everybody. I'm Molly Smith, your host. Michael Voris is with us this evening. He is talking to us about a brand new program that he's rolling out. Um, started it a couple of months back. And as he explained in the previous segment, the, the, this whole program has come as a response to listeners and to viewers who use his material, who are out there doing what, he, what they need to do to be able to become better Christians, better Catholics. This is a specifically a Catholic program. But as Michael and I have spoken offline, this program, I think, will have interest for everybody because as he so so you know very well said in the previous segment there is a resistance to everything right now within the country within in fact I think within the western world Michael and part yeah, of it is, is to do part of it is to do with the fact that we are now deciding ourselves who is Jesus Christ you know Fulton Sheen said and I know you love Fulton Sheen I do too I think yeah, he's the most wonderful absolutely. wonderful guy and he said when you leave the decisions to man to decide who you think Christ is you always, always, always end up with confusion. And I think that's what we're dealing with right now is this incredible confusion. Absolutely. So, yeah. so uh, you know, where are we going to go? What are we going to see out of the resistance? Well, I think the first thing we're going to see is a return, a, a call to a return to personal holiness. And, uh, you know, there's an old, probably one of the oldest maxims, maxims of philosophy is you can't give what you don't have. And when we say things, you know, as you have said, and commentators say, oh, we're losing some moral values, oh, there's, you know, family values are going away. What do we really mean? What we really mean by that at, at, down at the basic foundational level is we are no longer holy. We have melded into the world, at least largely. We may still have a hue of Christianity here or there, but, you know, for Christians, Catholics and Protestants, to accept, uh, you know— be ambivalent about or quasi accepting of abortion, uh, you know, stem cell, human stem cell research, you know, fetal temp, uh, stem cell research, uh, uh, you know, divorce and remarriage. All of the all of these things are opposed to Christ, mm -hmm. and you know, you just think of this in terms of scales, you know, like scales of justice. And imagine an image like that in your mind. Every time you take a little something off one side or put a little something other new on the other side, the scales adjust. And eventually, when you have nothing on one side and, scale, and everything on the other side, the scales are completely different. They're the opposite of how you started out. And, but you only notice it you know, one little item at a time. And so the very first thing the resistance is going to be is a call to people to realize that if you want the world to change, you have to change first. You cannot give what you don't do not have. It doesn't make any sense for people to be, you know, standing out in front of abortion chambers, for example, and you know, waving signs and save the babies and all of this when they themselves aren't holy. Mm -hmm. They need to be holy, and they can't be holy if, on the one hand, they're supporting, you know, the pro-life cause, but on the other side, they're ambivalent about contraception because mm -hmm. abortion comes from the whole contraceptive mentality. 
they can't be, you know, sort of pro Jesus on one side of the issue, but on the other side of a, a, uh, sorry, they can't be pro Jesus on one issue. And then on the other issue, say, for example, gay marriage, they can't be ambivalent towards that because, oh, well, my niece is a lesbian or, you know, my, my grandson is gay. I mean, you can't do that. Mm-mm. You know, there, exactly. the, 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 the moral broad cloth of our Lord is one singular thing, and it must be pure. And the moment you start allowing for exceptions here or there or this or that is the moment you lose the day. And the slippery slope is not a fallacy of logic. It is, has been proven over and over and over to be a truism of the world. <laughs> and once you get the camel's nose under the tent, the whole camel follows next. And um, so the first cause of the resist, first movement or the first action of the resistance will be to a focus on this. You know, what does the church teach on this issue? Why does the church teach this? Do I have any doubts, concerns, um, how do I now, once I either believe this or come to believe this, how do I now tell other people about it? The, the, the Christian faith from its earliest days was always spread person by person, and always. You know, there was, I mean, there was, of course, the, you know, the great barbarian conversions. You convert the king, and then you convert all 20,000 of his barbarians with him, but that's only because the king would kill them <laughs> if yeah, they didn't convert. Yeah. So that's not really a conversion of a people, maybe a conversion of a person, but it's not a conversion of a people. But I think we need to really get back to the understanding that I need to be St. Michael. Exactly. You need to be St. Molly. That's right. And you need to want, and you, and only then can you give, because you know, you can't give holiness if you don't have it. Yeah. Exactly. And there has to be that concerted effort. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden i you know, I've got holiness now, and so now I can give it to others. And holiness is a day-by-day thing, mm-hmm. just like evil encroaches on our lives day-by-day. You know, every time you turn around, there's a new bill introduced into some legislature, or there's a new shocking scene in, I don't know, on Facebook or the social Absolutely. media. Or there's this new star coming out saying this new stupid thing in Hollywood or whatever. It's just And see, that's how they do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't wait until they've achieved pure evil to start promoting evil. That's and we can't so wait true. until we've achieved total holiness before we start. We need to be on the road to holiness. And too many people today who claim Christ as their Savior just simply aren't. Mm-hmm. And this is true in the Catholic world, and it's true in the Protestant world. They just they have a comfortable Jesus, and they're good with that. And yeah. that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is not comfortable. This is why Catholics have a crucifix up in a church to remind you that you know this is the you know the way to heaven is suffering. Yeah. It's self-abnegation. It's the cross. It's all of the things Jesus himself said, our Lord himself said, pick up your cross and follow me. Absolutely. And, you know, and he who, who, who saves his life will, you know, will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will save it. It's just that simple. Nothing's changed in 2000 years. What has changed is the way people look at that. And in our great materialistic, you know, me centered, self-identifying, you know, never wanting to sacrifice anything, culture, well, that's just not compatible with our Lord. No. You have to choose one or the other. Absolutely. And I think the reason we see all the destruction, social, and I mean, we kill children by the millions in Absolutely. this country. Some of them, we take their little aborted baby parts and we sell them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We sell them to people for research and stuff, and then we abort them a certain way so as we can make sure to preserve this particular organ and not mess it up as we're chomping the child to pieces in the womb. Absolutely. How perverse. I know. And yet and people yawn their way through this. Absolutely, and, Michael. And we need some passion about this. We need to be passionate. Absolutely. This 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 demands that we become passionate about it. I mean, I I just I you know stand outside sometimes outside of the the big the huge big abortion clinic here or some, a facility. It's not a clinic. It's just it's dreadful. It's yeah, a mill chamber. Yeah, it's a chamber. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I, there's there's a dear dear couple of prayer warriors who stand there, and one of them says, and actually an evangelical pastor, and he says constantly that this place is open by the by the with 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 the blessings of the the church in our area. If every Absolutely. pastor would get out there and stand in front of it and demand that it close down, it would be done in twelve hours. You know. Mm-hmm. 
So, so absolutely we're seeing that this is, this is exactly what we've got to do. We've got to get some passion into what we're doing. If we don't, I, I, you know, I see, I see disaster. It's, you know, yes, while, while the abortion numbers may be going down a little bit, we're seeing the, the, the medical abortions, the, uh, you know, the, the chemical abortions going way up. So mm-hmm. we, we're not really doing too much. What we're doing is, is chasing yeah, it under the, under, the yeah, we just, all. exactly, exactly. We're talking to Michael Voris, who will be with, back with us in a, in a couple, in just a, about 30 seconds or so. Stay with us. Michael is with St. Michael's Media, also with Church Militant, uh, TV, TV, which is a, which puts out the voice Vortex every day. Please go to their websites and uh, sign up on St. Michael's uh, uh, St. Michael's Church Media. Militant. That, Church Militant, <laughs> yes, yeah, Church Militant. And on St. Michael's Media, you have an incredible amount of wonderful programs that people can download. So please do that. Stay with us. Be back with you right after this very short break. Welcome to From the Median, a daily report from the front line of the pro-life movement, discussing two worldviews that are driving our culture in opposite directions. From the Median asks, which side of the road are you on? What direction do you want our culture to go? Tune in as we plan the route that takes us back to the culture of life. And now your host, Molly Smith. Welcome back, everybody. Michael Voris is our guest this evening. Michael is with churchmilitant.com. Again, I would ask you all to please sign up for his one every morning or every day Vortex, which comes out. It's an excellent source of information about the Christian world, particularly about the Catholic world. It is very, very focused on what is going on within the Catholic Church, which is why we have Michael on the program this evening. He is going to be setting up, starting the process of setting up a program called Resistance. We've been talking about that, Michael. What helped you to choose that name? I, you know, I know it pretty well says it for itself, but there's lots of different things you could have done. This is a very striking, very almost strident name. Um, it, was there a specific reason for this? Yeah, I think the main reason that uh, we went for it was in, along the way of stridency is to give people sort of a focal point. If you're resistant, if you are the resistance, well, then you're resisting something. And the something that we need resisting is the evil that has come into the church. And it is evil. Uh, you know, our Lord himself is not being preached. What is being preached is accommodation of uh, things that are antichrist. Mm-hmm. And that's just it. And that needs to be resisted. And, you know, proper catechetical instruction needs to be given, not watered down, you know, ridiculous, you know, social lovey-dovey Jesus that, you know, yeah. yeah, it's it's really interesting because one of the things that I see that's that's happening is, um, you know, the, this this modernism. You know, we've got to be part of the yeah. world. We've got to be relevant in the world. And if we're not relevant in the world, Michael, then we're not anything. And if we, you know, we're losing people out of our churches because we're not relevant in the world. And so, therefore, let's just let's have a look at all these different progressive ways that we can do this and then accept them in as our teaching. And, you know, one of the things that I am very, very concerned about in the Catholic Church as a Catholic is this whole idea of we have to uh, adjust our teachings according to our experience, according to our personal experience. So if I experience, and you talked about this a little bit in one of the previous segments, it's it's my experience, it's what I want to see. Instead of, you know, it's not the great I am, which is God, he is the great I am, it's me that's the great I am, and then how does God fit into me? It, it's yeah. turned on its head completely. It is, and 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 when anything, whenever the truth is inverted, then that's the, that's the, the hallmark of the diabolical. And I think that's what we have to face here. And you know, Satan has done such a clever job making people who believe in, who say they believe in Jesus, completely ignore him. Him meaning the devil. I mean, the devil is a real being. He is a real person. A real, you know, a horrible. Saying, you know, how can anybody follow Jesus and not believe in the devil? It yes. makes no sense. And yeah. even if you believe in the devil, then you believe in what the devil tries to accomplish. The devil, what the devil tries to accomplish, is the destruction of your soul. And look, you cannot say you believe in Jesus Christ 
and reject what I just said about the devil. That's right. Our Lord said this about the devil. The Holy Spirit says in the sacred scripture through St. Peter, you know, beware the devil is roaming about like a roaring lion looking for someone, looking for someone to devour. His mission, his, his raison d'etre, his whole reason he exists is to be the, uh, is to destroy you. And this is what our Lord, who is primarily Savior, he is first Savior, he is not friend, he is not teacher, he is not companion, he is predominantly first and foremost Savior. The very first three times he is referenced in the New Testament, once before he was even born, uh, was as Savior. Gabriel told the Blessed Mother, you know, you will uh, you know, you should be called the Son of God and you shall save the people from their sins. And it's been a very clever uh, uh, mind control game, propaganda game that he has played because Christians have allowed themselves to be played. Because let's face it, Christians they are, you know, are human like anybody else and have all the same temptations and everything, all the same old stuff. And they did not stand pat when it came time for the uh, the great sort of onslaught of the sexual revolution in the 1960s and following, and we're still in that revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't, the Christian, Catholic, and Protestants did not stand pat. Protestants gave in first, and then Catholics gave in, and simply, you know, organized their lives around their sexual thrill. That's what they did. We, we did, you know, the, the fathers would abandon their families because they would want to go have sex with someone who was not the mother of their children. Uh, you know, the women have completely abandoned their entire notion of what is, as St. John Paul used to say, they're, they're, they're the true femininity. And what is the true fem- femininity? True femininity is motherhood. They abandon their motherhood to become like men. And uh, so everything that we're seeing right now is a reflection, is a result of all of this. So we can't change this stuff going on in the culture, because to attack this is, is pointless. What you have to attack, what you have to resist, is the mindset that has gotten us to this point. And that mindset is very simply uh, that what Jesus Christ said isn't really true or applicable only insofar as I like to accept that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. People, what we have here really, uh, in, in essence, is a functioning semi-Arianism in the Church. In the, in the Catholic Church, it's already long established in Protestant you know, communities that there is a in-practice denial of who Jesus Christ is. Absolutely. And when you deny that, you deny it. So that's how you can easily get to the point of, oh, well, there's no devil at all, that hell stuff is stupid, and well, then it's just a bad choice, it's not really some thing that affects my soul and all that. That's how you get to all of that, because you, you take Jesus off his throne, and everything else follows suit. And we've replaced them, as you said, we've replaced the whole notion of, uh, you know, uh, I am... God says, you know, of himself, you know, a God-centered world and replaced with a man-centered world. And now here we are, stuck, uh, and I do mean stuck, uh, with a devil who wants everybody to believe that he doesn't exist, and everybody perfectly willing to change the idea of who God is. So, what do we have? We have a God who says, I am, and a devil who says, I am who am not. That's right. And when people when people start believing there is no consequence for their sin, then they abandon sin. I mean, they abandon you know uh, fighting against sin in their own lives. Now we see that manifest in the Catholic world. There's no way to measure that really in the Protestant world because Protestants don't have the sacrament of confession. But in the Catholic world, we do, and we can see the absolute dirt in all of this because. You know, so many, many, many Catholics simply no longer go to confession. That's right. And why do they not go to confession? They don't go to confession because they don't believe they've committed any sin, or they haven't committed any kind of sin that's, you know, noteworthy. And why is that again? Because they have lost their understanding of God. That's right. They have lost, they've lost their understanding of 
who Jesus is. Jesus is God. God mm-hmm. hates sin. He detests sin. And sin is the one thing God cannot brook. And because of that, they have no, they've lost sight of God because they've lost sight of sin. And you have this kind of cycle going on. The more you have a corrupted version of God, the more you have a corrupted version of sin. And the more you have a corrupted version of sin, the more you have a corrupted version of God. And that's this sort of cycle that you start devolving down into where essentially, well, what do we really have now in America, Molly? We have a godless society. Yep. Yep. And, and President I, Obama said it very clearly. He said that, you know, America is no longer a Christian uh, uh, country. I mean, he made that right. statement. And, and, and he's right. And he was absolutely right. It's not. It's absolutely not. Yeah, it, yeah. it hasn't been. The reason, he, the reason he's president is because before he became president, it had already ceased to be a Christian nation. America hasn't been a Christian nation for decades. And yeah. decades. What we have are these sort of fumes, I guess you could say. We're living on the fumes of a Christian society. You know, it's just like when your your the needle in your car goes down to E, but you don't run out of gas instantly. I mean, eventually you will, but just because your little light comes on blinking and you know it makes the little ding ding and all that, that's just warning signs. Yeah. But it means if you don't get gas, you're done. Yeah. And that's where we are. But the point is. Nobody in America, there are few people in America today, are actually able to hear the ding ding and see the light going blinking off and on yeah. because they don't want to. Because they don't want to. Exactly. And you know, Michael, we're dealing with this right here in, in Ohio right now. And I know many people in Michigan have been uh, you know, contacting us and asking us, you know, where, how can they find out the same information in, in Michigan? Um, but but the the whole situation with this end of life bill that's got just been passed through our Senate um, here in Ohio, it is devastating. Mm-hmm. It is devastating. Yep. We've got an end of life bill that has been promoted under the under the guise of of very nice sounding words, which are so evil, and um and it has been promoted by a, a senator who is on the honors roll of. The Ohio Right to Life uh, uh, PAC board. So, the, so, so we we are seeing this creep into everything we are doing. We're seeing this relativism. This, um, you know, we, we've got to get, we've got to become part of the world. You know, when we get into a hospital situation, we see it. It everything, everything is just unraveling because we've lost this this Christian ethic, this this understanding of. The Almighty, our Almighty God, who is, who is the answer to everything. I mean, He really is. It's you know one of the things that I I I, I listened to you say on, on your on your resistance when you were announcing the resistance program. Um, you quoted Pope Pi- Saint Pope Pius the Tenth, where you ha- we this is where we've got to get to pray as though everything depends on God, and we have to do that. Because yeah. I don't see, I, I don't know how we're going to do it. And then the other part of it is, you know, and then go out there and work as if everything depends on you, sort of saying. I think that's the, that's the other part of the quote. But um, yeah, we, yeah. what? We need both parts. Yeah, yeah. We need both parts, and and we, it's no good anymore to just, you know, to just sit back and and sort of wring our hands. Those of us that understand what's going on, we have to get actively involved. Do you see your resistance um, pro- project really? Um, uh, what sort of what sort of success rate? And and I and I that that's not the right term to use because I don't think. You know, you don't you don't work to be successful. You work to be you know you 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 work fa- faithfully, and that's the most important part. But are you seeing a lot of people that want to come into this movement right now, and that are that are really out oh, we, there? We, we, the, the, the few the, the few times that we have done this have turned into uh, has turned into hundreds. I mean, five six hundred people have already signed up. To oh wow! In some way or another. Oh, wow, yeah, Michael, that's it. so encouraging. That is so encouraging. We're talking to Michael Voris. He'll be back with us right after this short break. He's on his way to another appointment. This man is a very, very busy man, so that's why you've heard the, the phone the line has gone a little bit of a different sound to it, but that's okay. He'll be back with us right after, and, I, and we really don't mind what kind of sound comes as long as we can understand him, which we can. So he'll be back <laughs> with us right after this very short break. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Molly Smith, your host. Michael Voris is our guest this evening. We've been having a great discussion about our need for all of us, regardless of what Christian organ of faith you, you are part of or denomination you are part of. We are all being called, very, very seriously called to get back to our our principles, to return back to the understanding that we are not what counts. It is God. He is the great I am. And until we understand, until we re-understand that, we will continue to go down this, this, this spiral, which is taking us further and further and further away from eternity. So if you, all of you are, well, the eternity that we want, we, we do not want to end up in, and that's part of the reason, Michael, that I get so upset about this. I know what the end, you know, I know what God has promised for all of us. And I pray every day that I'm part of, you know, eternity in heaven. But there is an eternity that that involves hell, too. And that's the concerning part to me. This is what breaks my heart. Because, you know, as yeah, you said. And, and, yeah, go. I was going to say, and, yeah, and hell is, you know, it's a horrible thing to hear and a horrible reality to deal with. But, you know, the vast majority of humanity will be damned and be in hell forever. Yeah. We have that from, from all of the saints in the church who have ever touched on this subject. We have uh, certainly that there will be more people damned than saved right out of the mouth of our blessed Lord himself. Mm -hmm. And this constant downplay, I mean, I I would ask everybody who's listening to simply step out of the question for a moment and put themselves in the mindset of Satan. Wouldn't, if, if you were trying to capture souls, wouldn't the number one strategy you lay out be that a soul doesn't ever really consider itself in danger of being damned. That's right. That would be your number one strategy. That's right. Because if you don't really think there's anything to worry about, well, then you're going to live your life accordingly. Mm-hmm. And again, why did our Lord come to earth? He didn't come to earth to just be, yeah, this is nice, and hey, what's it like being on a cross? And hey, it's kind of nice to rise from the dead. He did this for us. And he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if, I mean, that's the hallmark of love. Hallmark of love is sacrifice. Every parent knows that. Everybody who's in love knows that. You know, when you love someone, you will sacrifice for them. And our Lord himself said that love has, you know, there's no greater love has man than this, that he laid out his life for a friend and make the ultimate sacrifice, martyrdom. Mm-hmm. So if that is not present in the mindset of somebody who says he or she believes in Christ, then they don't really believe in Christ. They believe in something they, of their own imagination. Uh, that they've labeled as Christ and maybe has some similarities to Christ, but it's not. And absolutely, this entire, this entire, uh, uh, you know, fiasco we find ourselves in here is because we simply do not believe that there are consequences to sin. And so then we sin wholesale. You know, I, I, I totally agree. I, you know, I've, I've had this discussion with many people in that, you know, well, he's a very good person or he's a very this, even though, even though we know for a fact that, that they are sort of living lives outside of what God has called us and, and Jesus Christ has called us to live. And, you know, it, it concerns me greatly right now, Michael, with regards to our, our own dear Catholic Church, because I see, you know, the acceptance of divorce, the, the acceptance of homosexual marriage, you know, the cohabitation. Um, you know, all of these things being being promoted to a level that I have never, ever thought I would ever see. And it's happening from the top down. It's unbelievable. One of the things that that you have done is you very recently wrote a book called uh, Militant. Is, is that right? That's correct. The name of the the book is Militant and it's by Michael Voris. I know that I got a my relatives are in Australia. I got many relatives over there in Australia that live there when when I came to North America, they all went over to Australia. So we're on different continents, but it's, it's wonderful because I get to have great vacations. So um <laughs> but but Australia is fantastic. It is lovely. It is great. But I I know that your book is over there because my sister mentioned to me, "Oh, you know, some of my friends are reading this Michael Voris's book Militant." Tell us a little bit about this book. If people in Australia are talking about it, what should we know about your book? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's, it's really the combination of 10 years. I mean, I started the Apostle at St. Michael's Media and then the sister Apostle at uh, Church Militant uh, started these 10 years ago. And 
uh, this is really kind of the reflection and the summary of everything that I have seen, heard, uh, thought about in sort of large 30,000, 60,000 foot views of things and, and putting pieces together. So there's kind of there's almost an inductive and deductive reasoning going up and down the ladder on oh that's why this crazy little thing is going on at this parish and this parish and that parish because this great big thing is going on up here and this great big thing going on up here allows this crazy thing to happen in this chancery or for this bishop or that whatever the case is so it's really kind of a uh, a systematic look at everything that has gone wrong in the church for the last, you know, 50 or 60 years, encompassing the last 10 from my own personal experience. But my per- it's not just my personal experience. It's what I have seen or heard and mostly heard from many, many other people. I mean, you can't run an apostle like we run and, and not come across, you know, thousands and thousands of people. I mean, I think in the 10 years that we have in the 10 years that we have been around, I would say that we have probably talked to, uh, I'd say, at least 10,000 people. Wow. Some for, some for very long periods of time, others, some of them in Australia, a very good priest in Australia. And as you hear all of these people's uh, you know, thoughts and opinions and what they think of all mm-hmm. of these different things and, and their experiences— you start to see the pattern, exactly. and the pattern is the same. I, I've been in, I think, 19 different countries in the last 10 years, and many places in America, and that's just where I've been physically present. I mean, that doesn't hold a candle to the thousand. I mean, we get we get a thousand emails into the e- contacts into the studio every week oh, wow. from everybody, mm-hmm. and uh, from all over the world. And you just can't see these, I guess what I would typify at this point, hundreds of thousands of people's experiences all over the world. They have nothing to do with each other, except they're Catholic, and they're experiencing Catholicism the same way. Exactly. Run down, ripped apart by weak leaders, uh, you know, horrible catechesis, accommodation to the world, all of the things. So I've taken all of that and sort of, you know, coalesced it into this book, Militant and broken it down into various problems, major problems in the church that need addressing. And we begin the book with the uh, sort of, you know, what is the church? You know, what is the Catholic church? What is the nature of the church? What is her mission? I draw the analogy using St. John Bosco, St. John Bosco's, um, uh, you know, the, the ship is a, a, the, the, uh, the church is a, a giant ship on the ocean being tossed about in all these storms and waves and having other little Navy groups attack it and all of that and draw the the comparison and you know this is what satan wants satan wants the catholic church destroyed exactly he's wanted it destroyed since 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 the last supper you know it's a noteworthy thing many many of our protestant listeners may not have caught this in their scripture readings but um the uh at the last supper satan demanded the apostles from our lord and it doesn't say that. What it says is what is Jesus telling Peter that that's what happened. He says, uh, he says, Peter, Peter, Satan has demanded you all so that he may sift you like wheat. Oh, but I have prayed for you, Peter, and when you are, and when you regain your strength, you in turn will strengthen your brothers. Imagine that at the Last Supper. Satan is there already trying to destroy the church, and the church hasn't even been officially constituted yet. Exactly. So he's trying to abort the church. Mm-hmm. He's a great abortionist, we know that. He's trying to abort the church before Pentecost even rolls around. Yeah. And uh, and so the whole point of the book is to sort of revivify this in people's minds, to make people go, oh yeah, that's right, that is what the Catholic Church is. That's right, this is, this is the Bride of Christ. Satan wants to rape and kill the Bride of Christ. That's right. And, and we have to stop it. And, and we need we to wake to up and up. do it. Yes, exactly right, and, and just be able exactly to be it. part of it. Michael, if people wanted to, to, to get in touch with you to, be, to learn more about the resistance that you're, that you're putting together, um, what is the best way for them to do that? All they have to do is just go to churchmilitant.com. And uh, uh, and click on the uh, click on the resistance button on the page, and um, 
uh, or just send us an email. The email's down there too if they want to help out in a certain way or they have more specific questions or whatever we can put. We can direct them to all of the information we have so far, but we're going to be having uh, some new information rolling out sort of structural stuff because we're still forming everything and getting it off the ground at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the next week, we're going to have an email going out explaining here's the various aspects of it, and here's what we're doing, and all of that stuff. So, Perfect. Uh, so churchmilitant.com. Church militant, church militant Let's make sure we get that out there. Churchmilitant.com. Go to there to get it. And, and, and then Absolutely. go. Yeah. Um, the other thing is your book. How do people get your book? It's right there on the page. If you go to churchmilitant.com, scroll down, click on the link that says, give me a copy of your book. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Michael Voris, as always, such a pleasure to, to, to talk with you, dear friend. I really, I really appreciate all you do. And um, well, let's stay in touch and it will not be so long again before you come back on the program. But thank you for all you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you too, Molly. God bless and God, God bless to all your listeners. God bless you too. Absolutely. From the Median is listener supported. Visit our website, fromthemedian.org, for further information or to make a donation to continue to make this radio program possible. Email us, radionews at fromthemedian.org or call 440-668-4049. Through our fromthemedian.org website, you can download this or previous programs for your listening pleasure or sign up to receive our weekly preview of upcoming guest interviews. Tune in every weeknight at the same time to listen to another great interview on From the Median as we plan the route that takes us back to the culture of life. This program has been brought to you by Cleveland Right to Life. 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 Cleveland Right to Life.